Washing Tech. One of the questions that I've been asked many times by our customers is, I want to build an ethical AI practice. How do I do that? Welcome to the Tech Policy Leaders Podcast. The world's most influential voices, keeping you safe and informed online. Streaming from Washington, D.C., America's tech law and policy epicenter. These are your leaders. This is the podcast. Tech Policy Leaders with Joe Miller, founder and CEO of Washing Tech. Washing Tech, safe and informed since 2014. My guest today is Kathy Baxter. She's an architect of ethical AI practice at Salesforce. Kathy develops research informed the best practices to educate Salesforce employees, customers, and the industry on the development of responsible AI. She collaborates and partners with external AI and ethics experts to continuously evolve Salesforce policies, practices, and products. Prior to Salesforce, she worked at Google, eBay, and Oracle in user experience research. Kathy Baxter. Kathy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So we've been we've been hearing a lot for a number of years, of course, about you know the responsibility that all companies have and not just tech companies, whether it's Target, where you might be giving your phone number, or Amazon, which seems to know basically everything about you and what your preferences are, right? And you know, in the wake of the Dobbs decision, which overturned Roe v. Wade, there are a number of concerns about what period, even period tracking apps now, concerns about what they're doing with people's location data and what platforms that uh, collect healthcare data are doing when it comes to uh, when it comes to how they're disclosing uh, that information to law enforcement in states in which millions of women are confronted with stricter regulations that went into effect as a result of that uh, as a result of that decision. So ethical AI is top of mind and you know we're so fortunate to have you here Kathy. So thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm always happy to talk about these uh, these issues. Um, the importance of data ethics and and responsible data collection and handling is more important than ever before. So what is ethical AI? Let's start there and you know say I'm I'm at Target or Star of Star any store really. You know I'm at the Target checkout counter, for example, or self checkout. Should I not be giving my phone number, or you know, is there something Target's doing on their end that I need to be aware of? And of course, you know, we're not just picking on Target, but these companies are so embedded in in our lives, and we trust them so much. So we could just as easily say CVS or I don't know Sephora's rewards program, right? But what should folks be thinking about here? Yeah, the information that is collected about individuals, sometimes um, it's what we call zero party data, that this is the information that you or I directly provide to companies. I tell you my gender uh, identity. I tell you my age. Sometimes it's first party data that you pick it up based on my actions. Um, you uh, see that I like to buy a certain kind of jewelry or a certain brand of makeup. And then there are the uh, um, inferences, the data that uh, you guess that maybe I am a um, smoker or I run marathons. Um, and that may be accurate because AI can be fantastic at guessing all kinds of really personal information about you that you would have no idea. Um, but then sometimes it can also be wrong, particularly if you're sharing accounts. So um, if my daughter is also buying things on my Sephora or my Ulta account, um, uh, then you're getting a blend of the two of us. And so I always say you get nothing for free. The companies that are giving you that 5% discount by uh, scanning your rewards card uh, or giving you a free sandwich every time you, you buy a certain number of, of whatever, um, it is you are exchanging the data about yourself with that company. And so uh, that may, may not even be shared with that one com company. It may not be shared just with Target or Sephora or Jimmy John subs. Um, they may be selling that data to others. And it can be very difficult to know because the privacy and data handling policies can be very opaque and difficult 
even if you took the time to read through them. So uh, I, I would say first and foremost, um, uh, being mindful of who you're doing business with. Um, if you don't like a company's um, labor practices or, or supply chain handling, obviously you don't shop there. You certainly don't want to give your data to them. Um, but then um, also uh, as an industry, I think it's more important than ever for all of us to, to uh, hold a mirror up to ourselves and deeply reflect on what data are we collecting? How are we handling it? And do we really need it, particularly geographic uh, uh, data? If you don't need the lat long data of somebody's location, don't collect it, delete it today. If there's a reason you need it, perhaps for a delivery, once that delivery is made, you don't need that data anymore, automatically delete it. Um, so I think there's a lot that we need to think about as consumers what data we're, we're willing to give to organizations uh, at what price. And then also as, uh, as the tech industry, as individual companies, what, in, what information do we really need to collect and what should we just not ever collect? And you're involved in, in multiple efforts and, and you know there's things that individuals can do, of course, and we have a checklist that folks can uh, download uh, to protect their kids online when they're pr playing games. They can find that at Protect Your Kids Online protectyourkids.online. So parents play a role, uh, companies play a role, but government also plays a role. Uh, so tell us about some of the multiple efforts with governments and, and standards bodies that you're working on regulations and standards uh, with for responsible AI. Can you tell us a bit about that and, and what are you recommending there? Yeah, I'm, I'm really proud to be a member of Singapore's uh, ethical use of uh, AI and Data Advisory Council. Um, they are doing some really fantastic work in the way of uh, AI model frameworks. And uh, they have recently uh, released an AI Verify toolkit that provides fairness and bias assessment, explainability and robustness assessments um, uh, in, a, in a tool for organizations to use to be able to assess their AI. And they are, they're not taking the approach right now of creating regulations uh, because there's, there's a feeling that there's so much that we still don't know right now. How much bias is too much bias? When is a where when is an AI safe enough to release? We don't know yet. Um, how can we be sure that we understand that an AI is explainable or interpretable enough that this is safe for use? So for the moment, they're not creating uh, regulations. Um, such as like the the EU, um, they are they currently have their draft EU AI Act where they are going to really regulate um, particularly high risk uses of AI. Another organization that I'm very proud to be involved with is the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, or NIST. They are developing a risk management framework as well as standards. And standards are so incredibly important. Uh, you know, having um, whenever you you go around to different places within a country, knowing that whatever that power plug is that you have for your laptop, that it's going to work in each building you go to, um, is really is really important. And so, similarly, having standards so that when I talk about bias, we're using the same language, or when I say that an AI is explainable, we both mean the same thing. Uh, and so that standards work is, is going to be incredibly important for the industry as a whole. Thanks for that. And, you know, folks need some sort of a framework that makes sense. And I've seen a lot of the work that uh, Singapore has been doing it. Singapore has been doing it. It's impressive. 
So let's turn to what companies themselves should be doing because not everyone has time to, you know, go to the contact page on Duncan's website and ask them, hey, what are you guys doing with all that information about how many munchkins I like to buy anyway? So, you know, they, they may, it may be a fleeting concern when they're, when they're still uh, checking out, whether it's on their phone or, or in the, in the store. Um, so, so, you know, you have to, have to make sure that the folks working at Duncan on the back end, that they at least have to be responsible people, you know, they have to be super ethical. And, you know, I have no idea how ethical the folks at Duncan on the Duncan are. So, you know, this is just an example, but they should be pretty trustworthy. Right. So what does that mean from your perspective, Kathy? And is there a model that that companies should be following? Yeah. One of the questions that I've been asked many times by our customers is I want to build an ethical AI practice. How do I do that? How do I even get started? Um, this is a relatively new domain. There aren't playbooks. There aren't standards yet. There aren't regulations like SOX compliance in the financial industry. And so even knowing where to get started can be very difficult. And so we published the ethical AI maturity model. And this is based on my own experience building an ethical AI practice at Salesforce, but then I also validated it with my peers at many of the other uh, big tech companies that have had ethical AI teams and practices in their companies for many years. They validated, yes, this matches the maturity model of how they went about building this practice. And we also found um, maturity models in other industries like privacy, um, security, and the safety industry. Uh, so Patrick Hudson, he's a well-known international safety expert. He has an excellent uh, safety ladder, uh, as well as aspects, five aspects of a mature safety culture. And so all of this really validated itself. And what we found is that there are really um, four key stages that, um, because we are short on time, I'll just touch on very briefly and readers can check out the full document later. But the first one is this, it starts off as like an ad hoc process of it just uh, somebody uh, raises their hand and asks, not just can we do this, but should we do this? It's very informal. Um, impromptu reviews, but there's no actual process um, in, in place. Um, the, the next stage is organized and repeatable. And this is where there's actual executive buy-in that, yes, we need to think about this formally. And this is where you create your ethical AI principles and guidelines. These are your red lines that you're not going to cross. This creates a standard language for all of the employees to, to talk about and understand what am I going to do? What am I expected to do? What should I not do? Uh, you've got formal education and, and you actually have formal reviews happening. And then the third stage, managed and sustainable, is where now you have a very formal process in place, starting from product conception, where you're asking what are the potential unintended consequences? How do we know if harm might occur and how do we mitigate it? You're doing formal bias assessments and mitigations, and you've got metrics that you're tracking to know uh, is, the, is the AI, is the system that you have created and put out into the world that you did all these tests in the lab is it actually uh, behaving responsibly? Are people being harmed? And then the final stage of optimized and innovation is just this continuous cycle. We are constantly working to get better, but every uh, part of the organization is involved in this ethics by design. Everyone has a part in understanding how do we sell responsibly? How do we market responsibly? Um, how do we ensure that any ethical debt we may have created uh, in a previous release that we resolve it in the next release? Um, so at a high level, that's the that's the maturity model that customers or a roadmap that customers can follow as they build an ethical AI practice at their company. Are you worried about 
about your kid's safety on the internet? We are here to help. Watching Tech's five-step checklist will take you through the process of protecting your kids and will give you tips on how to set up the best parental controls for your children on their devices. You want what's best for your children. They deserve to be safe online. Our step-by-step guide will help you make sure they are. Download Watching Tech's online safety checklist today to protect your kids online. Find it at protectyourkids.online. That's protectyourkids.online. So one of the things that's been cool about doing this podcast is how often we've had guests on to predict certain things that have actually come to fruition. Like we had Renee to rest on here talking about the disinformation blitzkrieg, and that's exactly what happened. So what's your crystal ball here, Kathy? What do you think is going to be the next big topic of conversation for AI? What's around the corner? Well, first and foremost, you can't have uh, AI ethics without data ethics how you are collecting data that is then used to train your model um, that feeds into your model that makes predictions or recommendations, that has to be handled responsibly. And many states in the U.S., um, and of course, there's been very strong uh, regulations in Europe, like with GDPR, there, there are increasing regulations around privacy and data handling. But now in a post row world, it's taken on so much more significance, as you alluded to in the beginning, where data that you are collecting can be used to create genuine harm with individuals. And of course, we've seen security release, security leaks and and. Um, data being held hostage. So I think we are going to see uh, uh, an escalation in different states and and hopefully at the federal level as well to have much stronger data privacy, data handling regulations. I hope we're going to see companies take this much more seriously than they have in past and have a more trusted relationship with consumers. There's so much data that's collected about you and I when we click on a website, for example, um, uh, maybe it's a travel website. If they, if that travel company is using Facebook or, or Meta for their ad serving, Facebook or Meta is collecting that information about you. You don't have to be a Facebook or Meta customer um, to share that data that they have about you, but you don't know about that, again, unless you've gone into the data privacy or data handling regulations. Um, And if you don't live in California, where you've got that little pop-up that comes up and asks um, about the cookies that are put on on um, on your machine, you can't really do anything about it. So I think one of my predictions is that now in a post-row world, we're going to see a strengthening of data handling, data privacy regulations. And I think we're going to see these companies get much more serious about how they are handling that data. Yeah, one of the other misconceptions that a lot of people have is that when they go to their doctor's office, they're protected by HIPAA. Uh, but only the doctors are are subject to HIPAA, but the developers of the, the website where you enter your appointment information, um, enter what your visit is about, you know, though you, you never know what's happening with that information if it's not under the doctor's direct uh, control. And that's something that uh, Alexandra Reeve uh, Givens from CDT mentioned in, in some remarks that she gave uh, during a CBS interview recently. So what are some other blind spots folks might not be aware of? I mean, what are what are some of the unexpected topics that that come out when come up when talking about AI? One thing that comes to mind for me is how schools use data on students. There was this, you know, this horrifying story about one school district in Florida using student discipline data to predict future criminality. And everyone I've mentioned this to is like, you know, like parents on a soccer field, friends over dinner. I tell them about this and they they're, they they think it's nuts. You know, and student data, I think, is one of those things, right, that people don't normally associate with AI. It's more about, you know, are my kids doing their homework? What are, what are your thoughts on on sort of the things that, you know, obviously we're, we're aware of the check and we're aware of what we're doing on the Internet. But what about, you know, things that we may not be thinking about? Yes, the the story that you referenced. There's there are so many 
like those. And as a parent, it just horrifies me. Uh, so um, it's come out that there are a number of educational software providers that have been harvesting student data. And so the software is given either at a, um, uh, at a steep discount or free to some schools, and the schools can sign away the right to their students' data and give it to these companies. And neither the students, much less the parents, know about it. And they have no say because the schools own the students' data. And it is everything from disciplinary data, their grades. Uh, there's uh, been evidence that they collect if the students get free or reduced lunch. Um, they get information like their social security number. Why do these companies need the student's social security number? So these companies are able to harvest this data and then track these kids because they have their address, they have their phone number, they have their social security number, they have all of this data. And they even have what I would consider HIPAA uh, related data. So they know, does the, does the child uh, have any medical issues? This is tremendous data that these companies can now follow about the students and they can make predictions about the students. So the example you gave of future criminality, they can also predict, do they think that this child will uh, do well in a certain college? Will they graduate from college? And they can sell that information to colleges to use during their decision making process. We don't have evidence that for sure that this has happened, but it's certainly possible. You just don't know because there's no transparency about this. And so um, uh, the federal government is looking into this now and, and hopefully they will regulate it. Um, but this is the, these are the kinds of things that when you feed this information into AI, it's, it's um, stunning what can be learned. And so if we don't have good data uh, ethics, we can't possibly have good AI ethics. Well, thanks so much for your time, uh, Kathy. I personally feel like I have more control over what's going on here. A little scary, but uh, you know, it's reduced some of the overwhelm. Uh, there's obviously a lot of problems that we have uh, happening here. What are some final ideas uh, you'd like to leave with us? But what are some final ideas you'd like to leave with us before we close? And where can we find you online and keep track of what's happening in this space and how Salesforce is trying to help solve these problems? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Baxter KB. And uh, I, I think the, the thought that I would leave uh, listeners with is uh, keeping yourself educated and informed, knowing what the sites are that you are using. If you are a parent and you allow your child on social media, you really need to educate yourself about um, how your child's data is being collected. What is the kind of content that your child is being exposed to uh, and figuring out what, what are your values and are these companies um, in line with your values? Is this the kind of company that you want to support with your data? Because your data in many ways is even more valuable than the money you spend on them. Absolutely, absolutely. And that is a brilliant note to end on. Kathy Baxter, Principal Architect, Ethical AI Practice at Salesforce. Kathy, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Washington.